Please stand as we worship.
Creazione Creation sings your story At your name Angels will bow The earth will rejoice Your people cry
as we pray together as the music continues this is a great opportunity for us as the people of God we've gathered having been prohibited for so long to come and sing our praises and now we lead we are led by the Holy Spirit to come and pray our praises so as the music continues why don't you offer your own personal praise to God, your own thanksgiving to God? That can just be very much in the quiet. You can murmur it. You can say it within your own heart. But bring your prayers of praise and thanksgiving to God. And I'm going to invite people who are watching at home as well to do something similar. That as the music continues, as you hear that, where you are with your household, to bring prayers of praise and thanksgiving to God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is to you alone that belongs eternal praise. We come and bring our heartfelt praise in the name of Jesus Christ. For you have been faithful and kind to us, sustaining us by your grace. Through every season, you have been close to us. There is no other name through which we can come to you other than the name of Jesus Christ. And so we bring all our prayers of praise, our songs, our celebration in his name. It is for his glory that we come and bring our praise and our worship. And so we join with your church throughout the world today. And we join with the psalmist to sing our praises and to shout our thanks to the one who has saved us the one who continually rescues us. Salvation belongs to you alone, Lord God. We have been saved through a mighty work of your hand, an activity of love. You have set us free. You have forgiven us our sin. You have forgiven us completely. You have forgiven us perfectly through the death of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so confident of our salvation, confident of the salvation that has been secured for us in Jesus Christ through his death on the cross we can be certain that the hope that we have for the future is going to be a good one
for fear is driven out, anxiety is replaced by your peace, and all discomfort is overcome as we trust in your unfailing love for us in Jesus Christ. So continue, Father, to be merciful to each one of us. Pour your Holy Spirit upon all of us, we pray, as we wait upon you, Lord God, and as we pray, come, Holy Spirit. Let us all learn to be merciful to others as you are to us. Forgive us when our attitudes and our actions towards others has been less than loving, when our selfishness and our pride has driven us to look down on others and dismiss them. Lord, fill us with your spirit that we may know the love of God being poured out into our hearts so that we may love others. The world around us needs to know the love of God. And so for the sake of Christ's glory, Lord, may we learn to love others as you have loved us. So Spirit of God, pour yourselves upon all of us. Lead us as we worship you this day. May our worship be spirit-inspired. May it be pleasing to you, Lord God, as we come and pray once again. Holy Spirit, come and fill us afresh. Empower us as we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The name of the Lord our God, oh, praise his name forever. seated. Well, welcome to you all this morning. It's good to see you. A special welcome to those of you who are visiting for the first time, or perhaps visiting to the building for the first time, and you've been with us online for some time. It is good to see so many of you come and prioritize the worship of God in Jesus Christ. Just a bit of uh, housekeeping for you, just to remind you that uh, when you're moving around the building, we want to encourage you to keep your face coverings on. During the singing as well, it's highly recommended. But while seated uh, during the message, you'll be able to be more relaxed and remove your mask if you feel comfortable doing so. Uh, but that's up to you. We're leaving that with you. A welcome as well to those of you who are watching online. Um, sorry that you can't be here, but it is good that you have chosen to worship with us as well. We hope that today, every one of us, whether online or in this building, that we will all know richly the sense of God's loving presence amongst us, for we need him more and more as we come and worship. So we hope it will be a blessed day for you. We'll be praying for that as well. Um, I'm hoping to guide you through the service as it's the first time we're back and we're trying our best to be hospitable to those who are watching online as well as in this space as well. Um, this is going to be the opportunity now that if you have children or young people and you would like them to go to the classes, that they are available for you and you can exit through the back that way, avoiding each other where possible. And if you are here for the first time with your children, grab anyone around you. I'm sure they'll be able to help you and point you in the direction to where your classes need to be. So our children and our young people will now go off to their classes.
Now, don't forget, following this service, uh, we do have an opportunity to connect with one another over refreshments. Uh, you'll need to go to the back of the church building for that at the kitchen hatch, and you'll be served um, tea or coffee. I mean, you're used to providing your own drinks, right? Did anyone bring those with them today? Maybe that has been the case. And those of you who are watching online, don't forget, you can connect with us at 6.30 this evening through Zoom just to hang out with everyone. You guys will need to bring your tea and coffee with you, but do come and join us at 6.30. Then from that, we are going to be led into prayer at 7 o'clock this evening. So that's on our same Zoom link. Um, At the end of the month, we always focus upon healing. So if you are unwell or you know someone who's unwell, then get them to connect with us on Zoom this evening at 7 o'clock and we'll be willing and able to pray with you. It's been a good time so far as we've meeting in prayer and encourage as many of you as possible to make that your priority too. So that'll be this evening at 7 o'clock and everybody is welcome to join us with that. Now next Sunday, uh, you are going to get used to a habit of having a lunch here if you are wanting to. So the first Sunday of every month starting next month, which means next Sunday, there's a Sunday lunch for you. Um, So come and join us. I've been told you don't need to sign up. I've been told there's plenty of food and you're all very, very welcome. And those of you who are joining online as well, if you are local, you're welcome to join in with that too. So that's next Sunday after the church service here. Our offering, as always, is going to continue as it's been during the lockdown. Uh, Here's the information that you need for yourself uh, to continue your giving or to adjust your giving. The information is straightforward. If you want to text the giving, you've got to text LBC MK5, the give and the pounds on the amount followed to that, by that number. Um, and otherwise, you can go straight to our website, click on our giving page, that's loutonbaptistchurch.org forward slash giving, and you'll be able to adjust, amend your giving or start to give whatever your situation might be. Really grateful to those of you who have continued in, in that way. Uh, at the moment, we don't have the provision to be able to collect any cash from anybody. Um, we don't have anyone organized to count it, but also it's not necessarily recommended either. But our offering bags are around. So if you need the offering bag, then grab someone of the deacons, they'll be pointing in the right direction, i.e. if you've got a check or something that's payable and it can go in a gift aid envelope, that can be slipped in. But at the moment, we can't deal with any cash. So just giving you a heads up for that, we are still promoting this as your best and most convenient way to give. But any questions with regards to that, do chat to any regular members here, and I'm sure they'll point you in the right direction. Now, uh, one of the things that we have been doing on Zoom, if you've, been managed, if you've managed to join us, that is, if you haven't, this is going to be new. Um, if you've been regularly joining us on Zoom, this is not new. If anything, you might think, oh, we're not going to do this again, are we? Um, but one of the most Googled things during the pandemic is, how do I pray? And it suggests that people within our own country are searching for God. We know as Christians that prayer is the means through which God uses by his spirit for us to draw closer to him. We also know that God answers prayer. We also know that we will always remain learners of prayer, students of prayer, because it's such a profound activity. And we need to pursue this as something that we constantly need to grow into. So we need to see ourselves as learners of prayer listening as well as petitioning and interceding and giving thanks and praise to God in prayer, but always submitting to God's will as he speaks to us as well and pray according to his purpose. So in the past Zoom sessions in recent weeks, I've been going through a small segment called How Do I Pray For? dot, dot, dot. And people have been sending me their requests about the kind of things they would like to learn how to pray for. So feel free to keep sending those requests in. If you would like to know how to pray for your spouse, let me know. We can learn this together. I'm not looking at anyone in particular at all at this moment. If you want to pray for your family, your children, if you want to pray for your workplaces, how do you deal with the challenging situation in prayer? How do I hear God's voice? All of these things, send them to us and we will take the opportunity to learn to pray in these contexts with one another. Today is going to be a little bit surprising. It's already on the screen for you. Um, How do I pray for Japan? Not the obvious thing to be asking. Perhaps it may surprise you. But the reason I posed the question, how do I pray? How do we pray for Japan? Because of the Olympics. Because of the Olympics. You can pretty much be guaranteed 
that where there's a sporting event, where the Olympics are taking place, in the run-up years previously, churches locally and and mission organizations would have been partnering together to see how they could serve their local community and share the love of Jesus Christ through the Olympics. And so I want us to pray for Japan particularly because there are so many restrictions in place that all the plans that these mission organizations have had, all that the local church has has prepared for, well, all of that is now restricted. So chaplaincy, for example, for athletes is now taking place online. Community festivals, which are a great way to engage with neighborhoods who don't know Jesus, well, they are few and far between because of the restrictions. And so because of this, everyone's had to adjust their plans. Now, previously, the goal had been amongst the mission partners, amongst churches, to deliver one million hours of outreach during and in the run-up to the Olympics. And obviously, that's now got to change. So what has it been adapted to? Well, now they're sending out appeal to the global church to say, will you join us and sign up to pray for one million hours for Japan? That would be awesome, right? I mean, how long is that? You're already shocked, thinking I can't even do five minutes. I'm not specifically asking you to do those five minutes or those one million hours, should I say. But what an ambition, and with, it's with, it comes with it a goal as well to see, I think, 10 million people come to know Jesus Christ over the next few, uh, few years, I was going to say weeks, a um, few years, which is an exciting ambition, and I would always encourage you to have such godly ambitions for your own prayer lives as well, and for Milton Keynes and wherever you're situated at home and your households and your families, have these ambitious goals in prayer and pray accordingly. So, with that in mind, not a comprehensive list, of course, but this is how we can pray for Japan at the moment. We're being encouraged to pray for, we need to pray for unity of the spirit amongst Japanese believers. Now, according to YWAM Tokyo, so YWAM Youth with a Mission, there appears to be a level of openness amongst the Japanese, amongst those, their hearts are open, and churches, as a result, are uniting together to support each other in ministry and pioneering in such a way as well. So we want to continue to pray for the unity of the believers amongst the churches in Japan as they seek to serve their communities together. This is an answer to prayer as well. We also need to ask God for a spiritual awakening among, awakening among the Japanese people. It is estimated that fewer than 1% of people are evangelical Christians. So the national religions of Buddhism and Shintoism, they are closely tied to Japanese identity. And so were anyone to come to faith in Jesus Christ, it is most likely that you will be rejected by your family. And so we want to pray for a spiritual awakening amongst the Japanese people that they may know Jesus Christ. We also need to pray for more discipleship and church planting initiatives in Japan too. So there is believed to be one missionary for every 64,000 people in Japan. So one missionary for every 64,000 people in Japan. Don't know if you knew this, but the Japanese are the second largest unreached people group in the world which is why we need to pray for this nation as well. So we need to pray with others for a spiritual breakthrough in Japan that leads to vibrant churches where individuals, families, communities encounter the love of God and transformed by it through Jesus Christ. And there are, of course, still some mission events taking place during the Olympics. So we need to ask God to guide the Japan-wide sports outreach through the work of the Japan International Sports Partnership. So within the national restrictions that are there, there are some outreaches taking place. They are just minimal, and so we want to pray for those things as well. These are some prayer requests that are coming to us that we may participate in joining the global church and praying for one million hours for the people of Japan. I'm excited by it. I can't really see your faces to see how excited you are for it. I'm just going to assume that you are excited because I know praise and prayer is always upon your hearts and minds and it delights you to encounter God through these means. Guess what I'm going to do now? I'm going to lead you in prayer for Japan. Let's pray together. 
Father, you have the nation's past, present, and future in your hands. Your desire is to see people know abundant life in the name of Jesus Christ. It is your will, then, that we pray for the people of Japan for your name to be proclaimed. It is a society that is consumed with the pursuit of economic growth and technological advancement, with close ties to Buddhism and Shintoism, and so we pray for a spiritual awakening, for eyes to be opened to the truth of Jesus Christ across all areas of society. We pray for the church. With our physical eyes and from our human perspective, it would seem there is little hope for the church in Japan. Half of the pastors are over the age of 70, and most congregations have little to no children's and youth work. But with eyes of faith, we look to you, Lord God, and we pray for revival. May your church have an increased desire to fulfill the Great Commission. And may churches become bold in their proclamation of Jesus Christ. During the Olympics, we pray for the increased opportunity for the church with mission partners to share with boldness the love of God in Jesus Christ. And so we pray for sports chaplaincy. We pray for the mission events that are planned, for the athletes themselves during the Olympics, and we ask for your will and your purpose to unfold. Let godly wisdom lead the chaplains. May the mission events be more effective than all expect them to be in this climate. And may the athletes be blessed and strengthened in spite of the restrictions. When disappointment creeps in, we pray for your encouragement. And when winning occurs, we pray for celebrations that lead people to marvel at our creator God, who sustains us all by his own word. We thank you that each one of us has been created in your image. We have all known your salvation in Jesus Christ. The love that we know in him has enriched us beyond what we imagine. And so we are so thankful for all that you bless us with, Lord God. Out of the overflow of what we've already received, we give our gifts and our tithes and our offerings to you, Lord God, asking that through all this, others' lives may be blessed. Other people may be enriched by your salvation in Jesus Christ too. And as we turn to your word shortly, Lord, hear our prayers for you to speak to us, Lord God. And in turn, may we hear you call to us to follow you with all that we are for the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we bring all our prayers. Amen. Why don't you grab your Bibles, because we're going to read today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the words of which will come on the screen that you're watching from at home, or if you're in this space here on the screen in front of you. As you grab your Bibles, I'm just going to grab some water real quick. Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 11. It's a part of our One Another series that we're working our way through. What it really means to be Christian community, because so often we make this up for ourselves as we go along. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, 
we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. I know you will be aware of this, but Christians, as much as anyone else, are prone to fear and anxiety about the future. That's often fueled by the present circumstances that we experience Our circumstances may be such that it causes us to fear about the future. Now, understandably, we can find ourselves, even in this present time, being overly anxious and overly concerned with the spread of coronavirus around the world. We can also become anxious about the future when we look at the lack of integrity that we see exhibited in our leaders. We can easily be discouraged by the pressure that we face in our workplaces or the worldliness that we experience around us, the potential news of ill health. All of this creates anxiety for us about the future and it can cause us to fear. We can also become concerned about our loved ones. We can be concerned about financial insecurity, relationship breakdowns. We, like everyone else, know that the world can be unfriendly and it can be challenging. And because we are so used to comfort and ease in the luxury that living in this this part of the world brings to us, we are potentially the least prepared generation for discomfort. Our wealth, our prosperity deadens our senses and it puts us to sleep. And this is seen in the church as well as outside of it too. Every one of us needs to be encouraged and built up. That's the nice part. But also every one of us needs to encourage and build up others. That's the mutual responsibility that we have. And as Christians, as the church, we are to be the most encouraging group of people on the planet. There's an ambition for us all to aim for. Now, through the weeks past and through the weeks ahead, we've been reminded once again of what it means to be a Christian community, particularly as we seek to recover and rebuild our friendships with each other. It's an opportunity, once again, to have any misplaced expectations that we may have on one another, they need to be corrected. And for us to be reminded of the mutual responsibility that all of us have to be encouraging towards one another. Now, if we settle for something less than what God has planned and purposed for us, if we create a community that is influenced more by the hope of our own personal needs being met, well, that will lead us to miss out on the blessing and privilege of being who we have been created to be in Jesus Christ together. Therefore, in verse 11, which I believe will come on the screen, there you go, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing in verse 11 of that chapter that we just read. Now, to encourage one another means to infuse one another with courage, to give each other confidence. And so we act and we speak towards one another that results in the other person living courageously and with confidence in this world as a follower of Jesus Christ. So we are to give each other the the courage, the confidence to follow Christ as we should in all circumstances. Which means we can never reduce the gift of encouragement to simply being nice to one another. Now, we may have noticed, because we are an extremely nice bunch of people, right? Even the people sitting next to you are a nice group of people. And because of that, we often think that the nicest amongst us, were there to be a scale, that is, well, they're the ones with the gift of encouragement. But that's not Christian encouragement. That's not the encouragement that's being given to us and being instructed upon us through the scriptures. We're all quite capable of being nice to one another, but that niceness 
doesn't always have that long-lasting, transformative impact upon us, other than perhaps in the immediate, you know, in the kind of warm, fluffy sense of, you know, pink rainbows and unicorns sense of niceness. And that is no encouragement at all. A genuinely encouraging Christian is going to love others in such a way that fear is driven out, courage is stirred from within, so that we may all go on to maturity in Jesus Christ, being faithful to him in this fear-fueled world. That's what it means to have a gift of encouragement. That's what it means to encourage one another. That's what all of us need to grow in maturity as well. This is the responsibility that each one of us has towards each other. This is what makes the difference in other people's lives. So the question has to be asked then, well, how is this done? Well, it's done with the assurance of the parousia. That means the knowledge that Jesus will come again. So from verses 9 through to 11, first of all, it's on the screen. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Or from, we didn't read it, but the verse is just before the chapter that I read. So from verse 16 of chapter 4, it says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever Verse 18, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Though we may be prone to these experiences of fear and anxiety, particularly about the future, there is a hope that each one of us have, because we are in Christ, that is better by far than any perceived hope that the world may offer us. The hope that we have is a more certain and it's a more beneficial response to any other resolution that we may turn to to relieve us from our own fear and anxiety. That hope is that Jesus Christ will come again. That's a fact. And for all of us who have placed our faith in him, this is something that we can look forward to with a great hopeful expectation that on that day all will be okay. That in his coming to us, it will be for our salvation. That's the confidence that every Christian community can have because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will come again. That is a fact. And for those of us who trust in him, in his death and his resurrection for salvation, we can expect the final end to evil, to suffering, to pain, to death, and the completion of the renewal of all things. And it will be a good day for you and I. It will be a good day for us, the true church of Jesus Christ, the faithful followers of him. It will also be a frightening day for sure. The scripture is really clear on this, that the day of the Lord, as often referred to, is going to fill the earth with a sense of horror on some level. But for the church, for faithful followers of Jesus, this is not something that we need to dread because the love that we receive from God drives that fear of that day away, and completely so. So, go on then, tell me, when was the last time we encouraged each other with these words? Tongue in cheek. When was the last time someone from amongst us, your circle of friends who are Christians, who may be confused and uncertain in their faith, when was the last time our response was to say to them, yes, but you know that Jesus is coming again, right? Or perhaps, more thoughtfully, more profoundly, as we consider the mutual responsibility that we have in encouraging one another, how many of us would be open to receive that encouragement in our time of need? Now, I'm not wanting to oversimplify this by suggesting 
that our pastoral response to every situation, every hardship is to say, yes, but you know Jesus is coming again, right? But it is the truth. And it has the potential within it to give us courage to live faithfully for Jesus in every circumstance and drive fear away. Now, the context of this letter that we've read in 1 Thessalonians is a curious one for the church in Thessalonica. Their concern is for those who have already died. And so they're grieving their loss. And so Paul, who writes, he's concerned for their comfort and their encouragement. And he's wanting them to grieve as Christians ought to grieve, i.e. with a sense of hope. They're able to grieve because of Christ. So not with hopelessness, but with hope in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what does he do? He writes to them and assures them of Christ's return and their being with Christ, whether they are awake or whether they are asleep, which are metaphors for being alive or being dead. Now, that may not be our context, but the truth that Jesus will come again does instruct how we are to give and how we are to receive encouragement and what it actually looks like in a Christian community. So we are to encourage one another. Here's the first thing that we get from this, to focus on the important in the kingdom of God. That needs to be our, folk, our encouragement to each other. So from verse 1, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The coming of Jesus again is a fact. So the second coming is a fact. Jesus will return. Now, when this is to happen, we have no idea and we're not meant to know. So we live today in the light that Jesus may come, I don't know, in the next five minutes. Tomorrow, I don't know, immediately. That's how we live our lives, with the assurance that Jesus will come again. So our hearts and minds are set on that reality, and we live accordingly. Now, I know some of us are talking about end times signs at the moment because of this global pandemic. I know some of us also talked about end time signs during the Brexit campaign in two. It's usually this go-to conversation for some. I don't know why really, maybe it's to try and get some kind of understanding to complex situations, I'm not too sure. We see the disciples getting caught up with these kind of conversations too. So there's a sense of need to empathize with one another with regard to this. But these kind of conversations have the potential to distract us. And the New Testament is really clear upon this. Jesus will come again. And we have been living in the last days since the resurrection of Jesus. And what matters now, today, is that we are concerned with the things of God. Now, what does that mean? It means our concern, therefore, our focus on the important is going to be our worship of him. Prioritizing our worship of him. Living a holy life being concerned with what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, witnessing for Jesus Christ. These are the things we are to engage with in these last days, which we've been in since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is a really helpful reminder to all of us when we get caught up with the unimportant in the light of the coming of Jesus there are right things for us to be caught up with as a church, and there are wrong things for us to be caught up with as a church. So not just in a moral sense necessarily, but in a kingdom of God sense. And so we need to encourage one another to focus on the important in the kingdom of God. We also need to encourage one another to be discerning. So the next verses that say in that chapter, it says... In verse 3, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, peace and safety was offered by Rome, by the Roman Empire, to anyone who would submit to Roman rule and on military power, their authority. And so it was part of the propaganda machine of the Roman Empire. And it's, of course, deceptive. True peace, true security can only come from being right with God. And this comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So it may not appear relevant to us, but it is. And that's because of the perceived comfort 
and ease we have pursued for ourselves over recent decades. Because what happens then is that transfers over into our relationship with God. And we are convinced that all is right with us and we don't question whether we have our ultimate security in other things rather than in God himself. Our circumstances can be deceptive. And so we need to encourage one another to be more discerning of this and help others discern this too. We also need to encourage one another to be alert and self-controlled. Or in other words, we can't stay in our pyjamas. Verse 4. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Those who know that Jesus will come again don't live like those who don't. We are those who know that Jesus will come again. And we can have every confidence that we have nothing to fear on that day. And so knowing that means we live ready for that today. None of us need to be surprised by the coming of Christ again, his second coming, as we ready ourselves for that day, living as if it will be any moment, as if it's imminent. So because of that, we don't stay in our pyjamas. We don't stay in our pyjamas through the day knowing that there are things to do. Instead, what we do is we dress ourselves and we are prepared for that day. So imagine an important guest coming to your home. And you've prepared all night for this. And the guest arrives the next day. That's what you're waiting for on your home, but because, at your home. But because you're tired, maybe from the preparation, or just because you're just so caught up with other things, you sleep really well that night. But you sleep through the knock at the door that comes in the morning too. Because the curtains are still drawn and it's still dark. Someone in the household, well, they're awake and they're ready and they're going to open the door. But we are not. It raises questions for us. How are we living our Christian lives? Are we awake or are we asleep? Are we ready for Christ's return? When he returns, what exactly is he going to find us doing? Getting caught up with the unimportant or living alert and self-disciplined and prepared to receive him. So in verse 9, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Jesus Christ will return. And this does not need to be a day of dread for us, but a day for us to look forward to. To dread it with a fearful expectation of doom and condemnation is to know that we are not prepared for it. To anticipate it with confidence today means that we're living for him today. And so we need to encourage one another with these words. Jesus Christ is coming again. Jesus Christ is coming again. And if you weren't wearing your masks, I would get you to tell the person next to you that Jesus Christ is coming again. To bring the Pentecostal back to the Baptist community. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? That we turn to one another and we say, Amen, Jesus Christ is coming again. And he comes to bring salvation for each, to each of those who are his. Those who belong to him. Those who have faith in Jesus Christ. He has chosen us to live together with him through the death, through his death on the cross. And so we need to infuse one another with these words in the light of this, infuse courage in one another in the light of this. Jesus Christ is coming again, and we need to allow ourselves for that truth to be received by us as one that gives us hope, that stirs confidence from within us as a work of the Holy Spirit within us. Because we are people who are awake, I think. I got a laughter. For those of you who are watching at home, I just got some laughter. So they are awake. We have a certain future. 
There is no need to fear the future. Very simply, because Jesus Christ is coming again. That's the assurance that all of us can have. The confidence that can be instilled within us by work of God's Spirit. Fear can be driven away. Anxiety can be replaced by peace. We don't have to get caught up with the unimportant. In fact, I strongly advise against it. Don't get caught up with the unimportant. Get caught up with the priorities of God's kingdom and be ready for him. Because Jesus Christ is coming again. And so because of that, with that hope in mind, we know what we need to pray as well. Because we know it will be a good day for us all as faithful followers of Jesus Christ, guess what we need to be praying? Come soon, Lord Jesus, come soon. That's the prayer. That's the prayer we all need to be praying at this time. Come, Lord Jesus, come soon. We're longing for you. We look to you. We are waiting for your salvation to come to us. And we have every confidence that on that day, that when, you see, when we see you face to face, when you return, it will be a good day for each one of us. So we pray, come soon, Lord Jesus, come soon. We're going to pray that now. Let's pray together. Father, we pray, come soon, Lord Jesus, come soon. Our hope is placed, our faith is placed in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for salvation. As we look forward to that day, unsure of when it will be, we pray for your Holy Spirit to give us the grace that we may be faithful to you, Lord Jesus, this very day. Forgive us, therefore, when we get caught up with the unimportant, distracted by those things that are just not upon your heart and mind. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may be caught up with the priorities of your kingdom, that we may be alert, that we may be self-controlled, disciplined, anticipating the good day of you coming to us, Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray again, come soon, Lord Jesus, come soon, as we come and bring our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing some songs together.
Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. 
So may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.